Well, hi folks, this is Darren with MyRV Works, and we've been getting a lot of questions on inverters and converters. Um, the one that just came in recently was involving an inverter on how to install it, how to hook it up, and what it does. So I'm over here at Sid and Trisha's house, and they have this groovy grease board here. And um, we use this in, we're doing a Patreon series on how to start, build, and maintain a mobile RV service business. So you can check us out on Patreon. And so you might see this grease board from some of those episodes. Um, so what I wanted to do is take a few minutes and explain what an inverter is and all those types of things. Okay, so if we're liking this, then let's just jump in and we'll, we'll go through this together. So what is an inverter? What is a converter? To answer the question on the differences between an inverter and a converter, we first must understand the differences between AC and DC current. Okay, so I've got two colors here to play with. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a line here and at the top I'm gonna write DC okay that's a d and then on the bottom i'm gonna write ac dc represents direct current only going in one direction ac represents alternating current going in two directions okay so ac and dc direct current alternating current what the currents are doing is inherent in the name of ac and dc so if we can accept that ac and dc get their power different ways so let's just look now on the let's just take dc for a second and again we're all driving to what an inverter is so dc can get its wave if i had my oscilloscope i'd show you a couple of these things it's really exciting or you can have a sawtooth type pattern there's all these different types of dc patterns but the point is they're all going in one direction Okay, in electronics, you might see diodes that only allow it to, it's like a check valve in water. It only allows a current to go in one direction. So think of DC current as, I don't know, skydiving. It's only one direction. You're not falling through the sky and coming back up unless you're a bird and you have wings. But So that's direct current. It's going in a direct point from point A to point B directly to the source of power where work is done. Work being done, work in the definition of electricity because you have um, amps, volts, watts, work. Work is how much, it's, a, it's an electrical term, work. Not physical, shovel type things. So direct current only moves in one direction. Now we get this from a battery. So think of your flashlight. I don't have my flashlight on me. Uh, flashlight right there. Cool, thank you. So this has batteries in it. Okay, I can open them up. You see how batteries work. And then you have a direct current of uh, power flowing from the batteries directly to the element, okay? Direct current. Alternating current is not like this. Alternating current is a nice, pretty sine wave, okay? And normally you'll see it with a line slice through it right there. Um, now, just as with DC, we have all these strange patterns that we can create using different electronic components. AC, um, there's single phase, you have two phase, AC, okay, there's even three-phase AC where everything's offset. Um, three-phase is used a lot in industrial settings. My whole background was dealing heavily with three-phase AC. Um, so you have single-phase and then you have three-phase. Uh, I believe Tasty Cake up in Baltimore had some specialized motors that used two-phase. But um, so if you're up in Baltimore, Maryland, you're eating Tasty Cakes, which I miss Tasty Cakes. Um, they had their own unique motor, so no one could steal their stuff. But anyway, so let's keep this really simple. But I guess the reason I mentioned the different phases of A, A phase and three phase, single phase and three phase is because just like with DC has its different mm, variants to do different things, AC has different variants to do different things as well. And um, so on the AC, if we've done a video on how electricity works, and we'll make a link to that up, up on one of these corners here. <laughs> um, uh, so you might want to, as a, as a um, prerequisite, maybe go watch that video on how electricity works. And I've also done a few other videos on differences between converters and inverters, but I've never done it with a grease board. So this is like really cool. So in the video where I talk about how electricity works, I, I do talk about the AC sine wave, the AC alternating current as like hot potato. 
okay? And we've either all played hot potato or we are aware enough with how hot potato gets played. Uh, or maybe a fire line where you're passing things down, okay? If you're in the military and you're unloading something, you definitely know what a fire line is. You know, you're unloading a helicopter and it, it all goes in one direction. So if, if this was hot potato or a fire line, <clears throat> then I've got the potato, I've got the bucket, I've got whatever, and I carry the bucket in, in one direction. The, let's do a fire line. The water is going in that direction and maybe put out the fire. And then I go back empty, not carrying a bucket, and I grab my next bucket and I pass it down the line, go back empty, get the next bucket, pass it down the line, go back empty. Okay, so you would say that with respect to me, I am alternating. Okay, and the bucket represents the, the charged particle that is being passed down to go do that word called work. Okay, work could be turn on a light, work could be um, make an element glow. Okay, so as I'm passing this charged particle down the line, whether in the AC or the DC realm, that charged particle could only ever do one of two things when it gets to the very end of the line. It could either induce a load or um, resist a load. Um, and go watch my video on how electricity works to learn a little bit more about resistance and induction. Okay, so there's really only two things that charged particle can do, and in the that analogy, I had it like a I picked up something. Let's say this is a piece of copper that I picked up off the ground. There's there's nothing to it. It's just a piece of copper, and I'm not being electrocuted from this piece of copper. So how is it that when I open up my electrical service panel and there's all these copper wires and I touch one, it electrocutes me? There, we have to excite that, and and this has to do with your inverters and converters. We have to excite the the elements that make copper copper okay so it's still copper but um i'll do a drawing kind of here let me let me erase this and this i would consider maybe bonus this this is just a little bit about how we get electricity into a circuit um so here i i wish i knew what the copper um element was i I'd, off the top of my head i don't know what copper is but say for purposes of, of example i've got my nucleus of the cell and and then I've got a proton here, and let's just say it looks like that. I don't know, okay. But floating around it, I've got the electron floating around it. And let's just say I've got four electrons. I have no idea what element this is, but it's an element, okay? And so if I induce this with current, maybe I'm capturing water flowing over a waterfall and I'm turning a, a, um, a generator and the generator is exciting things. And all of a sudden, I get these electrons that are floating on the outside and they just jump to the outer orbital. It's still copper. I haven't changed my number of anything. I've still got my my four uh, el electrons floating around my my circle, and then um, so now they wanted to be here in its relaxed state, copper sitting on the ground. But we have put power into it, whether it's through steam or coal or or riding our bicycle with that little dyno on your wheel to make your light turn on. We're exciting this copper. So so now it's traveling from point A to point B in this excited state and it's trying to find its way back home. It's trying to get itself back to ground. We put it in a prison and it wants to escape. And it will escape through you human heart, okay? Or it will escape through anything, but it will want to get back to ground. And so when it gets back to ground, these relax and go back to their position where they ha are happy. And then it's just copper sitting on the ground. But in the process of giving up this energy that it carried with it, work was done. Okay, so we, we take this copper, we excite it, we get it in a wire, we start moving it back and forth, and we, we push it to turn on the camera, turn on this light right here. And then when we turn on the light, we use up that power and it just becomes bare copper sitting on the ground, or gold or silver or, or aluminum or any other element that we use. So that was a little bonus thing on, on how electricity gets into the circuit. But we're going to go back to inverters and converters. But all of that answer of a converter and inverter has to do with these, these, the differences between AC and DC. Okay, so we hopefully understand the differences between AC and DC. We understand DC could come from a battery. Okay, plus and minus. A battery is a storage device, as my flashlight was a storage device. So I'm making that light turn on from from power stored in my battery. These excited electrons stored in my battery, I use them up and they go do work, turn on my LED on my bulb. Um, so that's stored in a battery. Uh, this The thing with AC, you can't really store AC. You have to make it on demand. Um, so a lot of times on these big industrial sites, you might have these big white Connex 
trailers full of batteries. And so um, they'll make AC stored as a battery and then send it back. They'll convert it back from a battery back to AC. So, um, but that's at the industrial scale. Let's talk about RVs and inverters, okay? But it is all interrelated. We're just gonna deal with it on a smaller scale. I don't think in your RV you're gonna be dealing with anything that's 240 or anything that is three phase, but maybe you do. And if you do, you can configure inverters to do that. But I don't think we're gonna to go to that on this talk. So we understand DC, we understand AC. Okay, let's talk now about converters and inverters and how they, they work with each other. Okay, so I've erased my board and we, we kind of have a better understanding and appreciation on the differences between DC current and AC current, okay? We're still moving that excited par charged particle from point A to point B. One is gonna push it and one is gonna go back and forth, okay? Uh, DC by its nature is limited on how far it can push. AC, you can, how long could you make a fire line? As long as you want to. So now let's go into the differences between a converter and an inverter. And again, I'm driving us to what is an inverter, okay? And I figured the best way to answer that question is to give you some, some backstory and then we'll dive into what an inverter is. So I'm gonna draw a line again, okay? And up here, as before, I have DC and here I have AC, okay. If we want to get, let, let, okay, so we have to ask the question, of perspective you need to we all need to agree on where we're going to stand when we're calling these things names okay we can decide to to give it a name on what the power feeding the appliance is and what it gives us out the other side or we can say well we want to know what is the net result what's coming out of this thing okay so if we want dc power out okay but we're gonna give it AC power in. So, so let's just say for the converter, C-O-N-V-E-R-T-E-R, -E -E we are going to give that AC current in, or here, let me just write the word in, and we're gonna give it DC out. <laughs> I'll get myself, this is out, okay? So a converter is gonna take this AC sine wave and convert it to straight go, okay? So we'll draw it like it's going back and forth like this, and this one's just going that. So we're gonna convert. And the way I like to explain how this works, I'm gonna erase this, okay? So take a picture of it, is what really helps the visual on what's happening here, and it helps us to tie in the term convert converter is I'm going to take an AC sine wave because remember a converter is going to take AC and convert it to DC. Okay, so I'm going to draw a line through it and what we're going to do is we're going to chop off all these bottom lugs, uh, part of the sine wave, and we're going to convert them. We're going to flip them up to the top. Okay, so we've they, they used to be here and so the converter is gonna just chop those off and flip them up, okay? So by chopping off the bottom of this thing, it's no longer going back and forth, is it? It's only going in one direction. And so that is one of the things it does to convert the AC sine wave to only up, making it just straight direct current. Converter, it's converting. It's converting the ups and the downs to only ups, okay? But the converter does something more than that because this AC and sine wave is giving us 120 volts. And as it relates to an RV, we're gonna give it 12 volts out. So there's a factor of 10 here. I'm giving it 120 and it's giving me 12. I'm giving it AC, it's giving me DC. So as it relates to an RV, we're, we're taking 120 volts AC and it's gonna convert it to 12 volts DC, okay? So, um, so one visual that will help you on the converting part is I'm going to convert the downs to ups, okay? So I'm going to get rid of the bottom part. Now we're back to what I drew originally with my little box or my sawtooth. And there's several different types of DC um, signatures. And if you have an oscilloscope, they're fun to play with. Um, but you have a 10-speed bicycle, for example, you have a little cog on the front and a big cog on the back, and you can switch your gears and change ratios. You're still pedaling the same, but you might go faster and slower. And so the way they go from 120 to 12 
is they might have a big wire with a bunch of windings and then a little wire with a bunch of little windings, just like on your bicycle. And so as that electron comes through here, it's got to go around a lot of times. And guess what? Remember I said there's only two things that, that, that a charged particle can do is induce or induct. So it's inducing. These two coils never touch each other. But, but because uh, I gave an analogy, I, I've done so many videos, but you've ever made Kool-Aid and you, put your, you get your pitcher of water and you pour your sugar in there and you tear your little packet and you pour it in there and you stir it around. You're not really stirring every single sugar particle and every single grape flavor crystal, okay? But you're inducing the water and you're stirring it and through this stirring motion, it's all blending, okay? But you're not necessarily touching everything at the same exact time. And so by, by going with a bigger winding and a smaller winding, just like on your bicycle with your different gear ratios, you're able to, some engineer somewhere figured out exactly how many windings and exactly what size gauge wire and exactly how many windings on this. This is the primary, this is the secondary coil is what they call it. And so your primary coil would be 120 and your secondary coil would be 12. We can make the primary coil 24 and 12. We can make it 240 and 12. We can make it 240 and 120. We can make it 12 and 12, 120 and 120. Um, so there's lots of these different windings inside of a transformer that's transforming or, or mm, inducing the, the, the current, but they never touch. That's what's so cool. So when you study electricity, you're really studying magnetism, okay? So by stirring this one, you're exciting and inducing this one. And so this is where we go from 120 to 12. Okay, great. So now we have an idea on the converter is converting 120 to 12 and it's converting all the ups to the downs. So we say it's a DC converter because it's, what's, it's, it's what the output of the thing is. Remember I was saying, well, we have to agree on it's what we're giving it or what we're getting out of it. So a converter, it has to do with what we're getting out of it. And so we will call this a DC converter. I give it 120 AC. And it is appliance, no different than a toaster, a curling iron, or hair dryer. It's an appliance. I'm feeding it with 120 volts AC, and it's giving me 12 volts DC out. That's a C. That's what a converter does. An inverter. Now let's jump over to inverter. Now here I have AC. So the converter out is going to be 120 AC, just like that was 12 volts DC. So now we're going to begin with the end in mind. But as it relates to an RV, we're going to feed it DC, okay? So we're going to feed this 12 volts DC, and it's going to give us 120 volts AC. There. So here we're going to give it 120, it's going to give it 12. Here we're going to give it 12, it's going to give us 120. So it's the reciprocal of what the converter does, right? So here I have, I'm going to, I'm going to draw it the same way, okay? So here I have my, my DC coming in. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take every other up and invert it down. So I'm going to take every other up, which is what I was drawing over here. Okay. So you see how I've just taken all these ups and I'm going to flip him down. I'm going to take this up and I'm going to, I'm going to invert it. I'm going to invert that. So that's how I'm going to go. I'm going to, that's how I'm going to recreate my sine wave. By inverting all the ups, every other up, I'm going to invert it to down. And I just created an AC sine wave, didn't I? I did, right? And so just like our, um, our 12 to 120, we could do this kind of a thing again. Now, that's old school. Nowadays, they have electronics. I think they're called IGBTs, integrated bridge, inter, IG, IG, C. Integrated Bridge Circuit Interrupter. It's got some four-letter acronym. I don't remember what it is. When we work in industrial with variable frequency drives, we get into all this kind of stuff with VFDs and how it takes this. Because if you're working with a variable frequency drive, here's bonus content, bonus round. If you're working with a variable frequency drive, it's taking that three phase, three phase in, and then it's converting it to DC. Then it's converting it right back to AC again, but it's doing it like on a dimmer switch. Pretty cool. So, um, and it does that with these electronic things. So... Now that we understand at a fundamental level, very high level, 80,000 foot view level on the differences of these things, um, we, underst we understood where electricity comes from, the differences between AC and DC, and hopefully now we understand the differences between a converter and an inverter. We're going to invert them down. 
Whereas this, now, now the other thing is you have these big buzz boxes, which weighs about 20 or 30 pounds. Those are the ones, if you ever take the cover off, they have these massive transformers inside and they buzzed, okay? The new ones are coming out with really small. This is done electronically. So no longer do you have these large transformers inside of these converters. It's all done electronically and they might call them a smart converter, okay? And just like the, the smart converter, now they have smart inverters. These things are small, lightweight, compact. And this thing that I was talking about with the induction is all done at the electronic, using electronic chips. Okay, it's pretty cool. Now, so if you are in your RV and you're boondocking and you need to run your microwave, your hair, I need a hair curler sometimes because my hair just, I need to curl it, you know or I need to turn on my microwave to make some popcorn because I need to turn on my TV and I'm in the middle of nowhere. And all those things were designed to live on AC sine wave, AC current, but all I have is my battery. Then I would need an inverter to take my power from my battery and invert it to AC and then I can plug things in, okay? So let me, I've got a couple more things to offer and then we'll be done, okay? So I'm gonna erase my AC sine wave, but I wanna get shocked. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna erase this too. We're done with this part. Actually, I'm done with the converter. I'm gonna make the rest of this, I'm gonna finish out talking about inverters because there's there's a couple more things you need to know about the inverter, okay? So I'm gonna erase this. We're, we've, we started off talking about where electricity comes from, differences between AC and DC, differences between converters and inverters. Now let's just answer the question, people. Um, I will switch to black. Okay, so typically your inverter is like something like this, okay? And it's gonna have a little receptacle on the end of it, something along those lines. Um, and then on the back, you're gonna have these little tabs that stick out and one's gonna have a plus, one's gonna have a minus. Remember I said this is like an appliance? It's almost like it's an appliance. So here I have my battery, plus and minus, and this is DC. And we know that this plug here is AC. And here I'm gonna have my little microwave. I gotta make my popcorn. That microwave works on 120 volts, but all I have is my battery. So let's just say this one's plus and this one's minus. I take my minus and I'm gonna connect it to my minus on my inverter. I'm gonna take my plus and I'm gonna connect it to my plus on my inverter. Best practices is to put a fuse right here. Okay, how big of a fuse? Read the manual. Because the manual is going to tell you what size fuse to put in there. The manual is going to tell you what gauge wire that needs to be. Okay? Don't go cheap. Don't go scrimpy. If you're going to do an inverter, go with big wire. Okay? Um, you can go with small wire, but you're only asking for problems. So you're going to have to pay a little bit of money, but you're going to have to get some good, nice, good size wire. Where's the gauge? Where's, where, where are you going to find out the gauge? You're going to read it in the manual of this inverter. This manufacturer is going to tell you what size fuse, what size wire, and what size battery bank you need to run this inverter. Now, these inverters are going to come from little baby inverters to big inverters. Um, typically, in your RV, you're going to get a 1,000, uh, 1,500, 2,000, 3,000. These are typical sizes we'd find in an inverter. How do you know what size to get? Well, how many of these appliances you're going to run at any given time? Okay but you might have an infinite number of appliances but only one little battery. So there is a little bit of math involved and if you guys are interested, I'm more than happy to go into some of the math on how to determine what size inverter you need and then what size battery bank you need. And then the whole other fun story we can have is how big of a solar array do you need to charge this battery to get the inverter to run the microwave. So that's a wonderful discussion to have. So let us know in the comments if you want us to go there. So we're gonna read our manual to determine our wire size. We're gonna read our manual to determine our fuse size. We're gonna read our manual to determine um, what all we can connect to this. Now, then they get into the thing of cost. Not all inverters are the same. I'm sorry. If we're out on, I'm gonna erase my manual. We don't need a manual. We're gonna erase the manual. But if we're out in the field, uh, we're on a job site, we need to run that table saw, that skill saw. We got some electrical tools to run. Uh, we could probably go with a, a cheaper inverter because, because there's two flavors of inverters, okay? One inverter, remember we were talking about, we give it DC, it gives us AC, so it's going to give us this nice sine wave coming out the, the end of it, right? I'm going to run my skill saw. We're going to go cut a piece of wood. We're going to build a cabin, okay? Um, so there is what's called pure sine wave and modis modified sine wave. The differences between the two, oh, fundamentally it's a dollar 
problem. Okay, so pure and modified. O D I F I E D. Okay, I was hooked on phonics. I can read, but I may not be the best at spelling. Um, so the pure sine wave, guess what it's going to do? It's going to create this perfect, from a DC current, this pure sine wave is going to create this beautiful, beautiful AC sine wave. Born from DC, born from direct current, the little brain in there, all these little electronic chips is going to make the most perfect, perfect AC sine wave to feed all your electronic devices. It's going to cost you some money. So I'm going to put $3 signs over this one. You can do it. It's going to cost you some money. But if you just need to run that skill saw or something simple, something with a simple motor that doesn't have a lot of electronics, then you, my friend, can go with what's called a modified sine wave. Bear with me as I draw this because it takes a lot of mental power to do this. So hold on. I'm going to do these little stair-steppy thing. Oh, look at me go. I think you get the idea. Oh, this is, this is painful. Okay, there you go, okay. So you see, instead of it being this perfect, beautiful analog value, it's more of a digital. I like to think in this is like when you're looking at your soundboard and those little peaks are going up and down, all this kind of stuff. So it's modified. It's not a pure sine wave, it's a modified sine wave. If you try to run your CPAP, your microwave, your TV, your electronic devices with a modified sine wave, it's gonna generate a tremendous amount of heat and it's gonna burn it up, okay? This is not the same as that. That is why I will give it one dollar sign. So these are very affordable, they're very cheap, but it's not gonna run your electronic devices for very long. It might start them, but because it doesn't have this nice sine wave, you get into things called harmonics and all this other really groovy topics that we can go into on harmonic distortion, but it will burn up your CPAP and all these things over, over time. Okay, so know going in that you have a very expensive pure sine wave, makes a beautiful sinusoidal wave on AC, or you have the modified sine wave, doesn't cost as much money, but it does this kind of thing, okay? Um, so just like anything, it's an appliance, but whereas like a, like a microwave, you give it 120 volts, it gives you popcorn. This one, you give it DC and it gives you AC, all right? So um, now, I do have some closing thoughts to share with you as we close out this wonderful discussion on inverters, okay? I'm gonna change to the blue pin. Um, when, I really can't stress enough reading your manual when you install these things. They've got a lot of information in those. One of the things they're gonna talk about on how, is import, how important it is to ground that inverter. Very important to ground that inverter. Um, but, the other thing that a lot of people may not really appreciate is as an appliance, just the fact that this thing is on, it's not doing anything. It's just on. It will drain your battery because it does take energy inside of this thing to do this conversion. Nothing is connected to it. We're not running the microwave. We're not running the hairdryer, the curling iron. We're not doing anything. It, the fact that it's just on will drain your battery down. Okay, and so on some of you, if you have, for example, like a Magnum um, with that RC7 thing, it's got the little turn dial on it and the little green display. Uh, some of those you might see a, a screen called Search Watts and play around with that screen. And so you might see a 5, 10, a 15 value on some of these inverters. Uh, Xantrex has these too. Um, and basically the thing will wake itself up a bunch of times each second. Okay, and it'll just say, hey, is somebody putting a demand on me of five watts, of 10 watts, of 15 watts? And um, in other words, if you have that setting set to off, then this thing's always going to be on. And I don't care what's plugged into it. And we ran into some issues sometimes with people running their inverter to charge their phone. And they had the search watts set to five watts. Okay, so what this thing's doing is he's waking up looking to see, is there a demand downstream of at least five watts or more? And if there is, then I will turn on, brother, and it's on, I'm gonna suck all the power and I'm gonna send it down the line. If there is no five watts or greater down line, then I'm just gonna go back to sleep and not drain the battery. So that's a savings feature. And so some of these folks were having their search watts setting set at five watts, but to charge their cell phone, it was only like maybe one or two watts. 
And so the thing never turned on and they wake up the next morning and their phone was dead. And so in those instances, we would say, okay, well, it's good enough to have this thing set up at Search Watts, but maybe plug in one of those like clock radios or something between the clock radio and, you know, maybe two clock radios, maybe that you might get five watts out of that. So then this thing turns on and you can plug your phone in. So play around with that. Um, these don't like to get hot. Okay, so when you're going to put this thing in there, it's not going to give off sulfuric acid or anything like your batteries will. So you could, you could put them all over the place, but they don't like to get hot. So you need to keep these things cool. So if they get hot, they lose efficiency. So keep these in a, in a place where they can breathe, get some air around them. Um, I also mentioned the importance of the gauge of wire feeding these things. If you starve this thing from power from your battery, it's going to work really, really hard and it's going to hurt your battery because it's working so hard to get the power into this thing to convert it to give it your AC. So I can't stress enough to read your, I'm pointing to where I wrote on the manual, aren't I? Um, read your manual because it will tell you what got wire gauge they recommend, what fuge recommend, what battery bank size they recommend, all those things. Um, make sure you're grounded. And if you're gonna ground this, make sure that your negative of your battery is also grounded to the same point. So we have a common frame of reference. Um, another thought is if you use one of these like electrical testers and you plug into this thing, on the inverter, it's gonna probably say open ground or something along those lines because it's not driven into a stake in the ground, okay? It's generating its own ground and that's why it's so important to ground it to the frame, okay? That is your ground. Um, other than that, I mean, know that there's a difference between pure and modified, understand the differences between the two. This one's gonna be more expensive. Reference your manual, um, keep them cool. And then how to know what size you need is really a function of how much you're gonna run at any given time. Okay. Now you're not overwhelmingly, there are some setups where you can overwhelmingly, you're not going to use your inverter to run your air conditioner. It will suck the juice out of this battery so fast. Can it do it? It can, but you'd have to have a massive battery bank to run that air conditioner for anything more than 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. So we would use an inverter to run your microwave, your TV, um, convenience appliances. Okay. And I did mention earlier about um, making a 240 volt. Well, if you're, if you need 240 volts, um, it, it, you say you must have 240 volts in your RV. I know some of you with the Bluebirds and the Prevost, you have a pretty big battery bank thing. Then all you do is you would get a second, let me see how good I can do with this. You would get a second inverter. Look at me go. Look at me go. Oh my gosh. I should have been an artist. And then they would be offset by each other. So while this one is produced, I'm going to do it down here. While this one is producing this sine wave, this one is producing this sine wave. Okay. And when you pull off of these things, you get 120, 120, giving you 240. So that's where you would do it. And if you needed three phase, guess what? You would just put a third inverter on here and then you would set them up in their settings. Where do you get that from? Reading the manual. And then you would set these up and you can get DC power on three inverters giving you three phase circuit if you needed to run three phase. Um, so there's a little bonus on that. So guys, if this was helpful, um, I just learned that that eraser is magnetic. That's pretty slick give us a thumb up. Let us know that you appreciate this. I love reading the comments. I don't read every single one of them because you guys are like really typing a lot. Um, I do try my hardest to read some of the comments, um, but uh, Trisha in the office likes to read the comments. And I believe, I'm not mistaken, that the this question came from a comment from one of you guys. So leave comments. And um, we harvest those comments and we might come up with content like this. If you are one of these individuals that really wants to start a mobile RV service business, and this is your dream in life to be an entrepreneur, self-employed, start your own business, best gig in the world, I can tell you, then over on our Patreon side for the $15 and $25 tiers, we've got a special just for you. Um, $15 a month, you get access to our how to start, build, and maintain a mobile RV service business. And we're opening up our doors and let you kind of virtually understand how we run our business. And you're able to just for the $25 tier, you have an opportunity to, to actually have a Zoom conference with Trisha and myself asking us questions on best practices on how you can get your business started. So um, without wasting any more of your time, thank you for your attention and uh, class dismissed. Happy Camper, same hour of your works. And we hope that from this introduction on how inverters work, you can be Happy Camper getting your popcorn made so you can charge your computer and watch all of our videos. Okay, this is Darren signing off. Till the next video. Bye.